It is said that familiarity breeds contempt. I'll ask you all a question. Just think of an answer. In your lifetime, how many times have you prayed the Lord's Prayer? From the time you first heard it till today, how many times do you think you would have prayed the Lord's Prayer? Can anyone give me guess, guess answers? I Thousands. pray daily. Thousands of times. Thousands of times. Lily prays it daily. Okay. Thousands and thousands of times. Okay. Um, familiarity breeds contempt. It is so familiar, we can miss its profound significance. Yeah. Um, allow me to share the following. His name was Peter. And he had a barber shop in a small town. One afternoon, when he had one of his regular customers in his chair and was trimming his hair, he saw the front door of the shop open and he noticed instantly that the man entering his barber shop was a notorious outlaw, wanted by the authorities, dead or alive. And a handsome sum had been instituted as a reward for his capture. When the barber was finished with the customer in his chair, the outlaw stepped forward, sat down, and asked the barber for a shave. So Peter lathered the man's face and his neck. He took his razor and applied it to the man's face and then his neck. And he had the sharp edge of the blade pressed against the throat of the outlaw, the Adam's apple, I suppose. And Peter knew that all he had to do was exert a simple amount of force and he could slit the man's throat Kill him on the spot, step forward and claim the reward. What a handsome reward. But, but, the last thing in Peter's mind was the idea of killing the outlaw. Though he was wanted by the authorities, this man was not, not only Peter's hero, but he was his mentor, his mentor in spiritual things. The man in the barber's chair was none other than Martin Luther. Martin Luther. And the town was Wittenberg in Germany. While Peter was shaving the great reformer, he took the opportunity to ask him a spiritual question. He knew of Luther's reputation, not only as a brilliant theologian and courageous reformer, but as a giant, a titan of prayer, giving himself to prayer every day for two or three hours. This was well known. And Peter took the opportunity to ask Luther for help. Peter asked, Dr. Luther, could you please teach me how to pray? You know, the disciples asked the same question of Jesus when they noticed the obvious connection between Jesus' life and Jesus' prayers. Luther said, to Peter, the barber of Wittenberg. Certainly, I will teach you something of this matter. After his shave, 
Luther went back to his study. He picked up his pen and he wrote a small booklet, not for the world, but simply for his barber. And he titled this booklet, A Simple Way to Pray. This little book is still available. We can all read it and be instructed by it. And I want to talk about what he says in that little book. But before that, two observations. The Lord's Prayer wasn't simply given, I mean, given simply to recite repeatedly, as is our custom. Of course, there's nothing wrong with repeating the Lord's Prayer every day, of course. But Jesus was giving this as a model, an example to show us how we should pray. Again, as we look at this prayer and also the preaching of Jesus himself, we ask the question, what lies at the center of the preaching and teaching of Jesus? What lies at the core of the teaching and preaching of Jesus? It is the proclamation of the kingdom of God. When we are engaged in prayer, the chief concern we bring before God are not just the simple daily matters of life, which of course are important, but rather it is the main business of our prayers is to pray for the success and extension of the kingdom of God. Not only in our country, but all across the world. So today, we are not doing an exposition. We're not studying the Lord's Prayer as such, but we're trying to learn the lessons that Dr. Luther gave his friend Peter the Barber. We're going to turn the statements into the Lord's Prayer, into our prayers. And as I try to do that, I want you also in your mind as we look at the prayer, to try and do it yourself. And then perhaps we can do it together. So let's begin. How does the prayer begin? What are the first words? Anybody? Our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven. How many words? Just four words. Our Father in heaven. And as we read those words, what other things come to mind? Now remember, I have had time to go do, through this and do all this myself. So, um, so I'll uh, present most of it. <laughs> so, our Father in heaven. And this is how I respond. Dear God, you are from everlasting to everlasting. You are immortal, invisible, the only wise God. You are the one, the only one with the attributes infinite, eternal, simple, immutable, omniscient, omnipresent. You are all of these magnificent things, O oh God. You transcend us by your majesty to such a degree that we are absolutely overwhelmed that we can come into your presence and say, Abba, Father. Your being fills every corner of the universe and beyond. And there is nowhere we can flee from your presence. You are here and there and everywhere at every moment. Yet your natural habitat is not this world. For you dwell in heaven. We are of the earth. 
earthy, but you are of heaven, heavenly. Okay, do you notice what I did with those four words? If I asked you to do the same, you will think of lots of other things that I haven't thought of. Right. So this part of the prayer is mainly the address, remember. It contains no great petition. So let's move on. Our Father in heaven. What's next? Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Holy be your name. The first petition of the Lord's Prayer that Jesus gave. The number one priority that Jesus gave for us to pray is this, is what? As we pray, oh God, may your name be regarded as sacred, as holy, treated not only with respect, but with reverence and adoration by every creature in heaven and on earth. But God, we know we live in a world that is profane, where your name is blasphemed every minute, privately and publicly. Now, I pause at this moment. Let me try and explain it like this. What does this actually mean? I'm not going to try and explain everything, but I think this one is important because it is the number one priority. You know, there are many situations in life that we are part of daily where we experience emotions of surprise, shock, fear, glee, delight, horror, etc. Strong emotions. Let me ask you, what is your natural immediate response? in any of these kind of situations? How do you respond kind of a default response when you see something horrible or when you squeal with delight or whatever strong emotion you encounter in life? On Facebook often you see OMG. What's that? Oh my God. Oh my God, yes. 80% of us respond with the same words. Oh my God. Some of us are a little more clever. Oh my gosh. But that's the same thing. <laughs> OMG. I think Jesus hears this a million and million and trillion times a day. And he says, I suppose, Father, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. I think God's spirit must sink within him when he hears people use the name of God in a flippant manner and never give it a second thought. It's a part of our culture. It's a part of our makeup. You know, some terms are still bleeped out on television, but not blasphemies of the name of God. We live in a world with no fear, no respect for God. And we Christians are not exempt from it. Now, I understand that we're all capable of any sin, even the best of us, murder, adultery, stealing, and all the rest. But I do not know how we show love and reverence for God and be so irreverent with the use of the name of God. You know, the Jews did not even take the name of God, Jehovah. It was so holy, they did not even pronounce it. If you examine your own life, if I examine my life and my own soul and find that I regularly use God's name flippantly, we need to ask ourselves some serious questions. 
For some of us, it may be your first and best clue about the state of your soul. It is even possible that I could be a regular church member. I went to church today, I would say. I go to church every Sunday and therefore I must be a Christian. I must rever God and his name. Not necessarily. I may be lost and I may not be aware of it. Jesus said, it's not what goes in a man's mouth that defiles a man. It's what comes out. It's what comes out of us that defiles us and others. Now, I realize that in our culture, this is not a big deal. But Jesus made it the number one priority for our prayer. So my prayer simply is, God, may you give us a sense of reverence for who you really are, that your name may be my Lord, because you are holy and we are not. Okay, the next words are, your kingdom come, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And we might pray something like this. Oh God, we live in a democracy. Kingdoms are a thing of the past. They might say kingdom of Saudi Arabia, but we don't know much about kingdoms. We elect our leaders. Sovereignty is foreign to us. And we're all together allergic to it. We don't want a king. And that's who we really are. But God, give us a love and a hunger and thirst for your kingdom. You have given us the king and he is our king. But Lord, the world is blind to his kingdom. We pray that you will make his kingdom that is so hidden from the eyes of fallen humanity. Make it known, Lord, that your kingdom will come to earth like it already is manifest in heaven. God, we pray that your will would be done on this earth by people zealous to obey you as the saints in heaven and the angels are every hour. We pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray that specially for the troubled parts of our world. Moving on. Give us day by day our daily bread. God, you know our needs. You know we cannot survive without the basics and necessities of life. Every day, every night, oh God, we need our bread. We need those things that sustain us, every one of which comes from your gracious hand. Forgive us, Lord, for often thinking that we made it by ourselves, by our intelligence, by our smartness, by our heritage, by our wealth. Forgive us, Lord, what idiots we are to think like that. Every piece of bread, every drop of water, every single thing that we have comes from your hand. And we ask, Lord, that you continue to sustain us, that you will take away our anxieties, that we may not be anxious about what we should eat or drink or wear or anything else in our lives. Give us the capacity to look at the lilies of the field who neither spin nor sue. You array them with such glory, Father. Make us ever grateful for these necessary gifts that you bestow on us so freely, so liberally, every day. The next words are, and forgive us our sins. 
and forgive us our sins. Our Father, we come to you acknowledging that we have rebelled against you, that we have committed cosmic reason. We have defied your law. We have asserted our wills over yours. The only way we can possibly stand in your presence is if you would forgive us. We thank you that you have made us just, that you have done exactly that, not by our achievement, not by our merit, not by our righteousness, but clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You have given the gift of his righteousness to us. You've covered our sinfulness and our sins, that though scarlet, we have been made as white as snow. Though they were crimson, you made them like wool. Father, it is against you and you alone that we have sinned. We ask that you would blot out our transgressions as far as east is from the west. Urge us with hyssop. Make us clean. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice, because as far as east is from the west, you've removed our transgressions from us. Thank you, Lord. As we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Lord, Though we have freely received your grace and mercy, we have been hesitant, we have been loath to extend it to others. We have not even forgiven members of our own family, let alone our enemies. We have not forgiven the debts against us as we have asked you to forgive our debt against you. Forgive us, Lord. And lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. We also know, Father, that you are so holy that you are completely incapable of ever enticing us to sin. You never do that. Rather, you call us to flee from sin, run away from sin, to come out of the darkness and into your light. We know that you would never tempt us to sin in the sense of an enticement. We ask that you would never put us in that place where we are naked and exposed to the wiles of the devil. Do not put us in the place where we are subjected to the test of our, our obedience of faithfulness to you. But Lord, like Job, before he was attacked, O oh God, put a hedge around us, protect us, not just from the world and the devil, but even from ourselves, our own evil inclinations. But deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from evil, the evil one. Almighty God, deliver us from Satan, from the enemy the one who goes about us as a roaring lion, seeking to devour whom he will, the one who disguises himself as an angel of light, that he may deceive us, accuse us, and bring us into despair and ruin. Lord, we confess that often we are deceived. Deliver us from the evil one, the prince of darkness. And the final words, which we find in Matthew's gospel on the Lord's Prayer. For yours, O God, is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Forever and ever. Amen. Lord, we live in it, your kingdom. We love it. We enjoy it. We reap the benefits of it. We share in the inheritance and the legacy 
of the king. But we know it is not ours, it is yours. In and of ourselves, we have no power. All power in this universe resides in you and in you alone. And any power that we have is borrowed and received from you. Forgive us when we boast of our own strengths and achievements as if we ourselves were the source of them. What glory do we have? Lord, our feet are clay. Our frames are dust. We're of the earth, earthy. We come to you with nothing in our hands, but all glory, Lord, and honor belong to you and to the Lamb who is worthy to receive glory, power, honor, dominion, now and forever, evermore. Amen. Amen.